is Jeffrey Birch, and he's one of my teachers, and he's an amazing, amazing, amazing person. He's a fabulous body worker. Some people say he's the best body worker in Oregon. Do you know that? Um, those are the people who don't know that you're the best body worker. Because <laughs> she's one of my teachers, too. We dance through the educational world in lots of roles together. Jeffrey knows more about anatomy than anybody I've ever met. I mean, I don't get around maybe that much, but still, you are the king of it all. And, and um, he is going to um, entertain us with um, information about lungs. Is there anything else that you want to say? That's a pretty good start. Here I'm we go. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm delighted so to be here, too. I'm going to be whiteboard for you. I'm going to take this little one out. I'll Do you want to move the table out of the way? No, I'm not comfortable with the table. Okay. Yeah. And actually, you know, maybe what we do is just take a uh, foot or two that way for the moment. All right. Perfect. Right okay. There. Is right. there anything else you need? I'm all set. You want some water? I'll bring you some. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. I'm honored to be here at the, this uh, first of what I hope is many events of this kind. Um, I will be talking about uh, lungs today. <clears throat> uh, both for mothers and for babies. Oxygenation, it's a good thing. We all need some, we all need enough. And we all need to be able to have enough oxygenation without too much energy cost to get it. And this uh, can be an issue during pregnancy and of course also for newborns who are arriving and using their lungs in the air for the first time. Um, as I talk about this, <clears throat> um, I encourage your questions. So at some moments, I'll ask you if you have questions, but please, stop me at any time for questions. Wave your hands uh, out there. The more I know about how you need to know the material, the better job I'll be able to do in getting the material to you. But speaking of questions, uh, I will also ask you some questions along the way, because I know that uh, among you in this room are also already most of the pieces of information that I'm going to speak today. So I'm going to help you to inform each other and to string the beads together into some useful ways to use that information. <clears throat> so we're going to start with uh, a bit of uh, anatomy first. Um, we have uh, a pair of lungs, one on each side. There are three compartments in the chest, left, right, and center. Who knows what distinguishes those compartments from each other, what the partitions are? <laughs> We've been talking about anatomy for three days. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the risks of arriving late in the last day. Uh, Four days, right. Yeah. Plural, <laughs> pericardium. What, yes, what, um, what um, right. supplies the oxygen to that area, right? the bronchus? Well, the bronchus is, is certainly the two uh, that uh, is on the way bringing the air into the lung. But what I'm talking about in the chest is the distinctions between the, the wall partitions between the compartments, left, right, and center. So, here we go then into the blackboard. If we have a cross section here through uh, an adult thorax at, say, about uh, uh, fourth thoracic uh, vertebra level, in the back we'll have uh, a vertebra, of course, and then there'll be ribs swinging around from there. And this is obviously not one rib because ribs um, angle down. So this is more here represents a cross section through the chest, probably cutting through two or three ribs on the way there. And the sternum up in the front. All right. We have a, a very important organ that's in here, <laughs> uh, often described as sitting on the left side of the body. That's not quite true. Portions of the organ are actually right at midline. It's just that the center of the organ is center of, of that. Now, we also know that uh, we have uh, a couple of lungs. Uh, there's, there's a right one and a left one in here. And what I was talking about before is the fact that, that these are not in the same compartment. 
they're all inside the chest, but the real estate in there is subdivided in important ways. Well, fascia, uh, yes and no. Um, fascia is a term you know, referring to certain kinds of membranes in the human body, and uh, there are membranes which are fascia-like, but what we, which we give different names to, reflecting their location. For example, in the abdomen, uh, fascia-like membranes associated with the organs in there are peritoneum, whereas up in the thorax we have pleural. 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 Okay, so lining the chest wall, velcroed into the inside of the chest wall here, we have membrane. And what might we call that particular bit of pleura? Anybody know? Costal and I'm going to have to speak up a little for my old ears and for the camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the intercostal pleura? Is that, is that well, you, intercostal pleura. Uh, that would be something between the ribs, and this is actually deep to the ribs. So this is parietal pleura. Uh, parietus is Latin for wall. It comes through to us in English as partition. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, so because this part of the pleura is against the wall out here, we call it parietal pleura. And then we have, of course, the same business on the other side here. And this uh, comes in this way. And then around here, and I'm going to leave a little discontinuity there for the moment. We'll come back to that. Okay, so, <clears throat> anybody know what this bit and this bit, these, these uh, portions of the membrane in the center are called? Okay. This is not quite. Pericardium is actually is actually deep to that, immediately surrounding the heart. These are the walls of the mediastinum. This central compartment is the mediastinum, but it's important to distinguish between the walls of the mediastinum and the contents of the mediastinum. Just as we have a lot of the walls of lovely, con lovely conference hall, and all of you who inhabit it and are the activity of the conference inside. So collectively, we have a conference, but it has walls and contents and activity here. So these are the walls of the mediastinum. And uh, the heart, together with the great vessels in here, and phrenic nerves, and vagus nerves, and the thoracic duct, are the contents of the mediastinum. So if you hear someone speak the word mediastinum, you first have to find out, is this person talking about the walls, the contents, or both in there? OK? <clears throat> All right. Now, um, so we had the parietal pleura out there, and we had the walls of the mediastinum, and they are absolutely continuous. Uh, they are and always were developmentally one thing. We just call different parts of it different names uh, for our convenience, reflecting their location in there. Uh, these were the two endosolomic uh, envelopes originally in, in development for those of you who have more uh, embryology. Well, that's all very good. Um, are there, is there any more pleura anywhere? Mm. All right. So what happens right here is a little developmental miracle that we'll talk a bit more about in a moment. So that these membranes are continuous with membrane, which is one with the outer surface of the lung. And that we call visceral pleura. <coughs> and again, it is and always was continuous with the rest of this uh, membranous system uh, in here. We'll talk a little bit about how it got there in a moment. It's pleasant for people who are interested in babies to know something about how bits of them develop along the way. 
All right. Uh, <clears throat> Latin for large organ is viscous, um, which comes through to us as the term visceral, which is an adjective form referring to anything having to do with an internal organ. Okay? So we have the parietal peritoneum lining the body wall and the visceral peritoneum, which is the outer surface of the lung, which are continuous with each other by way of the wall of the mediastinum there. And you have a double set of that left and right. All right then. Uh, everybody good with the uh, structure so far? Any questions about, uh, thoughts about anything there? Is it the visceral pleura or the visceral uh, peritoneum? Visceral pleura. Did I misspeak and say peritoneum? I do things like that. Okay, this is visceral pleura. Better, but... Yes, thank you. Uh, part of the issue is these membranes are absolutely continuous with the, the similar membranes in the abdomen. Developmentally, uh, as we approach 40 days after conception, the uh, diaphragm, the respiratory diaphragm, grows in from the body wall as two leaves from the side and intersects these membranes. So we heard the word fascia earlier, and these are quite fascia-like. We just give them names reflecting where they are in the real estate system. Peritoneum for abdomen, pleura for thorax, but they're all fascia-like membranes in there. And quite continuous, as indeed all the connective tissue in the body is. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so what can be found between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura? Fluid. Hmm? Fluid. 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 Very good. And what sort of fluid might one find there? Pleural fluid. Pleural fluid. Yes, indeed. Actually, I've never quite heard that term before. But <laughs> <laughs> it's always pulled out. We, we do, what we do with our synthesis, it's pleural fluid. It is it. Okay. Pleural very good. Pleural fluid. Um, <laughs> and there's a little more general Lip. name. Lip. 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 Well, it is essentially identical with lymph, and indeed the lymph system plays into this in a way that I'll describe in just a moment. But uh, again, reflecting location, uh, we give it a different name here. Serous fluid. Okay. These membranes, both the uh, pleura and the peritoneum, are as a general class serous membranes. And they uh, leak fluid, they excrete fluid into this space. It's essentially blood plasma. It's the same thing as lymph, uh, it's the same thing as cerebrospinal fluid with very minor differences, and all of them are essentially blood plasma. We leave the red and white blood cells behind. All right, so that leaks into this space uh, on a regular basis through these membranes from the adjoining tissues. Uh, what? Yes, please. Is it manufactured in a cell like, let's say, um, uh, autocrine cell or an alveolus in the breast? Is it manufactured or is it, um, is it filtered from blood? It's filtered from blood. Important distinction. It is literally a filtrate of blood uh, in through there. Okay? So are vaginal secretions too, right? Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, and so, uh, everywhere in the body, fluid from the circulatory system, from the blood, leaks out into adjacent tissues. How does it get its way back into the circulatory system? Lymph. 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 The lymphatic system is a little vacuum cleaner that scavenges it from everywhere and dumps it back into the body where? Yes. So clavian veins, okay? Um, and so the way this works is that serous fluid is constantly leaked into the space. Wouldn't want too much in there. It's very bad. You just want a thin film. It serves as a lubricant in there so that I can move around and my lung will glide on the inside of my body. So my lung can go up and down as I breathe and it glides inside. But too much is bad because it's filling up the space the lung can't inflate fully. So it's very good, the lymphatic system withdraws the serous fluid, and because there's constantly fluid in and fluid out, the space is washed continuously, and we maintain a lubricant in that space. It's very good. Okay, 
<clears throat> now, I mentioned that there was something special right here. Um, and this is the connection between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. I'm going to erase a bit over here so I can put up another drawing. Before there were any lungs, there was an esophagus. <laughs> and the, um, actually before there was an esophagus, there was a stomach, and the esophagus grew up through the body from it, and came out, and uh, off the end of that, Grew a stalk grew a very interesting flower, which includes the mandible and tongue and the facial bones below the middle of the eye. But <clears throat> off the front of that, at um, mid 30s days after conception, grows a rod of tissue going down and forward, which promptly forks left and right. And this rod of tissue, the cells in it, on the outside of the rod of tissue, grows faster than the cells in the interior so that the cell, the rod, pops itself open and becomes a tube. So we have the trachea and the primary bronchi growing down this way, all right? So out in front of the esophagus, we had this rod of tissue growing down, which then forks left and right, and each of these promptly forks again and each of those promptly forks again. And you used to have the bronchial tree elaborating yeah. down this way. And that's happening within this mediastinal space, which was formerly much more narrow in here. And so what happens is you have um, We have the um, esophagus down in here. And the heart hasn't arrived yet, or is just arriving from its earlier position up under the, uh, the chin. And so we have this rod of tissue which grows forward into this space, and then forks and starts growing to the side, and as it grows to the side, it, and starts branching, it's pushing out the wall of the mediastinum ahead of it. So you see, as it grows, the membrane which is, surf is its surface in the developing lung was originally this little patch of the wall of mediastinum, right there. Okay? And this process continues until eventually we have lung rather well filling the space, and what had been this little patch of wall of mediastinum is now the uh, outer surface of the lung, which we call the visceral, visceral pleura. Visceral pleura. Okay. So all of these things always are and were um, uh, continuous. I mentioned the heart was arriving down from in here, and of course, as the lung tissue is growing out this way, it has vasculature that goes with it right out of the heart. The vagus nerves growing down from the brain go out and grow out with the lung. The, the lymphatics, of course, invest that. And so we have this little area right here, which in New York <coughs> is about that size and shape for each lung, centered at about fourth rib level. Anybody know what it's called? Hmm? Thymus? 
geographically very close, predictable yes, but no. <laughs> Hylum of the Hylum, right. And the Hylum of the Lung is the only place where there is any natural structural attachment of the lung to anything else in the body. And part of why I gave you the embryology of this is so you would understand how it got that, came to be that way. If you know embryology, you know anatomy. And anatomy makes a lot more sense. Okay. <clears throat> because uh, your back was to me. Um, the hilum is is it plura? The hilum is plura, and um, specifically, it is the reflection of membrane from wall of mediastinum to visceral pleura. Uh huh. Yes. And before, and and what occupied that space before there was a lung? I spoke it just a moment ago. No. Part of, part of the wall of mediastinum. Mediastinum. Yeah. Remember, all of the visceral pleura was originally that little bit of wall of mediastinum in there. It just ballooned out to become the visceral pleura. Okay? All right. Now, um, this is important that this is the only place that the uh, lung has any structural attachment to anything else. The important part of what we're going to be doing here, I'm really not going to talk forever, practical exercise is coming soon, I know you like to get your hands on things, is uh, how to deal with the all too common um, fact that people develop other attachments out here. They develop adhesions between visceral pleura and parietal pleura. They are common enough that in the medical world they are viewed as an ordinary aspect of aging. Well, my friends, it is ordinary, but that doesn't mean we're going to put up with it. <laughs> As you can see, it's not a good thing. And by the way, while it's viewed as an ordinary aspect of aging, I can tell you the babies are sometimes born with these in place already, too, because they have some age from the time they arrive here. And those of you who have been around this world a little while know that uh, those first nine months, it ain't all a cushy ride. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned that this is the only natural structural um, attachment of the lung to anything else. Why is that important, that there be so few structural attachments? For movement. Movement, yes, we like movement. Life is about movement, lungs must move. But is it not attached still to the parietal, in no. effect, from the, from the embryology? No, well, it is. However, the hilum... Mm -hmm. is the only continuity with the parietal pleura. Okay. Okay. I have two questions. Yes. What is hilar cartilage? Hilar cartilage? Yes. Well, um, is it at this reflection, it's reinforced. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. It's just a thickening. It's a thickening. Of that hilum. Of the hilum, of the wall of the hilum. Okay. Now, indeed, as we spoke of the walls of the mediastinum and the contents of the mediastinum, in exactly the same way you need to speak of the walls of the hilum and the contents of the hilum. If someone simply speaks the word hilum, they're referring to walls and contents, you hope, or they might be referring to one or the other. Yes? No, no, no. I'm just... Yes, okay. So, one more question. Please. <laughs> yeah. So you want to whisper it by me? No, it's just, it's a little, I, I'm a nurse, I work in a radiology department, and people often get, you know, uh, fluid in their lungs that we tap. I hate that when it happens. Mm. So yeah. is it because they're getting a backflow from there? It's usually from heart overload. Mm -hmm. Does the fluid back up because it's not being reabsorbed in that membrane, or is it overflowing from the hilum, the pericardium to the hilum? Anyway, just, how does that happen? Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're 
talking about here is um, uh, basically where the plural effusion, plural effusion, called. you know, where where the uh, law of the heart is over overrun and it's not able to keep up with the returning blood to pump some out, mm -hmm. and this results in accumulation of fluid in many parts of the body, at the ankles, for example, and. Uh, my understanding of it is that simply the um, lymphatic system in that situation is not able to keep up with withdrawing enough fluid from here. If we don't have, if we didn't have a lymphatic system, we would all blow up well, like Michelin men with fluid out there. And indeed, that's the sort of thing that happens when you have a not well functioning lymphatic system. How many people in here have lymphatic drainage training? Mm, good. Okay. Very important. Uh, all right. Lung tissue is not so sturdy compared to other tissues. How many of you have ever held a uh, fresh lung in your hands? Fresh. Yeah. I mean, it could be human or it could be for some other creature. You know, it's, it's pretty slippery, goopy, uh, not very sturdy kind of stuff. And if I have an adhesion over here between my visceral pleura and my parietal pleura, and if I make a sudden movement in my thorax, I risk, risk tearing my lung. This is going to result in a condition called pneumothorax. pneumothorax, where I now have air from the torn lung into this space around the lung. The lung uh, is it held inflated against the chest wall, by the action of the lymphatics, making a partial vacuum around it. We just broke the vacuum. The lung falls in, the ribs spring up, lifting your ribs no longer moves the lung, air is not being exchanged. Please get prompt medical attention unless you wish to apply for reincarnation. Does it heal quickly in adults? Like I know my son was meconium aspiration and they, they gave him um, this when they were resuscitating him and um, he healed within like two days. Um, yeah, how long is aren't structurally there. sturdy? They, they actually have kind of amazing repair and immune f facilities. Um, and consider, here's something that's a wet, delicate membrane open to the atmosphere breathing God knows what. And, you know, we can get in trouble sometimes, but it's actually astonishing that they do as well as they do uh, out there. So they, they, can, they can knit themselves back together fairly quickly, but often it's good to have some help yeah. along the way to that. Otherwise, you can let, end up with a permanently collapsed lung. This is bad in lots of ways. Okay? Yes? So in, in babies that sometimes have the high lung that sometimes doesn't get completely open, um, and babies have difficulty breathing. Yeah, particularly with preemies. Uh, you know, you're not going to use lungs, lungs for much of anything useful until after birth. So the, while the lungs are fully in place by um, day 43 after conception, they're not really up and running yet until at least eight months or so. And so earlier on, you have immature lungs, and then there's a host of problems, and that's why they're over in the PICU. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, other things can get in there. If you bleed into this place, that's, that's called a hemothorax. That's worse than a pneumothorax, because instead of just air in there, you've now got a bunch of blood pooled in there. How's the lung supposed to inflate against that? And by the way, the blood's not being exchanged, so it's static, and it's microbate. Uh, for, for sepsis uh, in there, okay? So, <clears throat> another thing, so if it, you have one of these adhesions between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, wherever it is, your body will recognize in its wisdom that you have a serious risk factor here, and it will engage musculature so to try to prevent you from making those quick movements in the thorax, and you will discover but you're now pretty thick, uh, stiff in your thorax, mm -hmm. or at least various parts of it. And the way that these membranes, uh, particularly of the walls of the mediastinum, continue into the neck and branching out into the shoulders, this is going to make your neck and shoulders and upper back feel quite horrid 
you won't like it at all. <laughs> One of the interesting things is the walls of the mediastinum have zippo nada pain nerves. That's the way they're built, no nociceptors. So they cannot complain to you about their condition, but they will pull powerfully on your upper thoracic's neck and out into your shoulders, where many of you may have noticed you have lots of pain receptors. <laughs> okay? All right. What does it take to get an adhesion across there? Where can one of these come from? What are the conditions that lead to the, an adhesion growing in there? What? Trauma? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oops. Hey. <laughs> chest wall blow. That will do it quite nicely. Um, Burns the chest wall and rub along. The body gets busy repairing itself, grows a bunch of new fiber. It's supposed to grow the individual membranes back together again, but the body isn't nearly as discriminating about that as it ought to be, and all too often you end up with them growing together again. Not unique to the lungs, happens everywhere in the body, it's just ugly when it happens to the lungs. How else can it happen besides trauma, blow to the chest wall? Infection. Infection. Who hasn't had some kind of uh, lung-related infection? The premier way to get uh, uh, plural adhesions is Pneumonia and its cousin pleurisy. Okay? But uh, a fine case of bronchitis will do. I've seen it happen with a bad cold. Okay? I've had clients that I've worked with, got them, their thorax is all tidy up, and they go out and get uh, the, the killer cold and come back, uh huh, here's a couple more uh, uh, adhesions in there. How else can this happen? Smoking. Yeah, I have a client who's in his 60s, has been a, a serious smoker for most of his adult life, and he comes in about once every two months, and I harvest the next crop of adhesions. That was mm -hmm. plural for him. Yeah. Surgery? Surgery, oh yes. If you have a cut in the chest wall, there's going to be uh, healing going on in there, and that growth of fiber can create them. What other areas of inflammation, like, like say, an asthma or inflammatory condition? Yes. Asthma absolutely will do this. People who have asthma history are going to have uh, multiple uh, adhesions in here. Now, adhesions come in various sizes and flavors, from things that are a few little wispy fibers across to industrial strength, somebody poured super glue. How are, are we ever going to deal with this? sorts of adhesions. Uh, anatomist Gil Headley has a lovely dissection video out there. You can find it on YouTube. Just um, go for Gil Headley and thorax or pleura, where he discovers a um, pleural adhesion in a client and teases it apart quite easily with his fingers. And most of them are like that. So they're actually kind of easy once you found them. Mm. Questions or thoughts about anything so far? You said what can, what can create the causation? Someone said birth, and I don't know if you heard them. Birth? birth. Yeah, I was just going to reiterate that. Yeah, birth. Um, and especially, I'm wondering, C-section birth. C-section birth? Or is that more likely to be a C-section baby? Well, C-section births are, are, of course, uh, make the woman's uh, abdominal pelvic cavities adhesion bait down there, but they're not so directly for no, I mean, the for, baby. Yeah. for the baby. Yeah. 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 Um, the one of the things that will happen, happen in some C-sections, uh, particularly if the water hasn't broken yet, is the precipitous drop of pressure inside. You've seen the amniotic yes. fluid geysering out, guess what's happening inside the thorax? <coughs> you know, right. uh, so I see good potential for that, yes, at birth, C-section birth. Um, and vaginal birth, when things go well, is arduous for babies and mothers, and things go downhill from there. Uh, so uh, babies with uh, broken collarbones, damaged uh, necks and so forth, or a dime a dozen, and sure, it can happen to the thorax too. Uh, more interesting, perhaps, if it's a breech birth, coming out the wrong way. No. So uh, there, there are opportunities there. Also, these happened to babies before birth. Mama had the flu while she was uh, 
pregnant. Guess who else probably also had the flu while this was going on? Mom fell down, whack. Baby's kind of cushioned, but also pretty delicate. You know? One of the things that happens in impact injuries is a problem with dense organs, such as the heart. If I fall here, uh, my heart and I are flying through the air together at the same rate of speed, and my body comes to an abrupt stop on the ground, and guess what? My heart's still going inside. It'll smack into its neighbors, bounce off bony things, ricochet around inside, bruise itself and its neighbors. And exactly that effect happens to babies in falls too. Yeah, they're a bit cushioned, but they're also a little delicate. Okay? So uh, a couple of years ago, I took a, a lovely refresher course in working with uh, newborns from, from Carol. We had lots of them in the room in the course of those days, and it just reminded me of uh, the incredible tangles that babies arrive with uh, in their bodies. It's a big deal. I'm thinking of all of the high school players playing football. Yeah. Oh, I love football. It's such a fabulous source of job security. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only use I've ever had for that sport. <laughs> I had a member of a college football team called me up the other day and he wanted me to come over and make his hamstrings longer on Thursday because he had a big game on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Mm -hmm. I think it worked out all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, how would you know that you had a plural uh, adhesion? Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Restricted movement. Restricted movement. Where? Breathing. Breathing. So, if you see a person and their breathing is, is limited, and particularly if it's asymmetric, that's one strong hint that you have some pleural adhesions in there. But there are other things that could restrict that, like tight costovertebral joints. So, you need to keep your eyes open a bit. But absolutely, observation of uh, breath. Oh, I want to bring up another thing. Down at the bottom, of the chest. The respiratory diaphragm, of course, attaches around the full perimeter of the bottom of the rib cage and across the spine and back. And from there, it domes up rather steeply. So when the diaphragm is relaxed, we're breathing shallowly or, or on an exhale, where's the top of the diaphragm? About fifth rib level. Fifth rib, all the way up there. All the way up there. Huh. Classic nipple line up there. So that means that over at the edges, it's doming up from the bottom of the rib cage quite steeply. And when we are on exhale or breathing shallowly, the diaphragm is against the chest wall. And then as the diaphragm flattens down while the ribs go up, that potential space opens and the lung is pulled down into it. And you can perfectly well have diaphragm to chest wall adhesions as well as lung to chest wall adhesions. So you have to watch for, for both of those. What's immediately under the, the lungs? No, it's not. No, the liver is not immediately under the lungs. There's something in between. The diaphragm. Yes, of course. Very good. All right. Uh -huh. That's a true question. <laughs> well, my question was, what's immediately under the lungs? The respiratory diaphragm. And you can perfectly well have lung uh, or adhesion to respiratory diaphragm adhesion, which of course is really visceral pleura to parietal pleura adhesion uh, over, overlying the respiratory diaphragm. Okay? So, anywhere you like. I want to throw in one more little piece here. I mentioned that the only place where the lungs have a structural attachment in the body is at the hilum, about T4 level, fourth rib level in the back is the center of it. There is a functional attachment of the lung up at the top, and it works like this. So if we have some wall, a wall of the mediastinum here, and we come up to the top, you're starting to recognize the shape of the lung here, but that's not the lung, that's the space that the lung is in. The lung is inside this. Diaphragm down here, chest ribs on the outside, wall, the mediastinum on the inside. Uh-oh, 
forgot something very important. Of course, the pylon right there. Okay, up here at the top, because the lungs are kept inflated against the chest wall by the vacuum effect of the lymphatics, the top of the lung is a soft point that fits inside a soft pointy shape, and it cannot escape that. It's vacuum packed into it up there. It can rotate in it a little bit, but it cannot escape it. So there is a functional fixation up here, but important to realize that is not a structural attachment up there. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> this membrane on the outside, uh, the visceral pleura up here, has immediately outside it another layer of membrane that is Velcro to on the inside of the chest wall, the endothoracic fascia, and there is fascial continuity from it known as the suspensory ligament of the lung, attaching it to the anterior surface of the transverse process of C7 up there. But it's kind of a misnomer. It is called the suspensory ligament of the lung, but it doesn't attach to the lung. The lung is vacuumed uh, against the parietal uh, pleura, which is welded to the um, endothoracic fascia, which is attached uh, by this uh, 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 suspensory ligament of the lung to the low cervical vertebrae up there. So the suspensory ligament attaches to the pleura? It's most obviously attached to the endothoracic fascia. Okay. Okay. Coming back and here, you know, I didn't quite put everything in the drawing, just try to illustrate certain things. <laughs> so we have the the lung, we have visceral pleura on the outside of it, we have the parietal pleura, but in between the two, in between the parietal pleura and the muscles and bones of the chest wall, there's another membrane known as the endothoracic fascia. The endothoracic fascia is one with the periosteum of the ribs. If you wish to, in dissection, take the endothoracic fascia out of the inside of the chest wall, bring a sharp scalpel, your lunch, and plan on making mistakes, okay? <laughs> on the other hand, if you want to take the uh, parietal pleura off the endothoracic fascia, it's not bad. It's kind of like Velcro. You can do that. So up here, it's really endothoracic fascia that it had, is ligamented to the low uh, cervical vertebrae, always seven, sometimes six, occasionally five up there. But then the parietal pleura is um, Velcro to the endothoracic fascia, and the lung is held to the parietal pleura by the partial vacuum established by the lymphatic system. And collectively, that suspends the top end of the lung. Do you have any recommendations for, or anybody, for embryological development courses for body workers? That you would recommend? Uh, Jeff Van der Waal. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't recommend Jeff Van der Waal at all. Why? Um, Jeff Van der Waal knows his stuff in embryology, but, uh, and, but he takes it in a very philosophical direction yeah. that I don't agree with at all. Uh -huh. uh, it's essentially, you know, the problem with um, observing an animal and attributing to the animal human emotion. It's called anthropomorphization. Right. And this is exactly what uh, the error that I see Van der Waal making in embryology is he's um, attributing to embryos drives and intentions that we don't know that they have. It's just that looks like, if you would say, it, if they are developing as if they had that drive, then I could go for it. But he says they have it. What about Eric Lechford's work? I know he doesn't have classes. I have all of Lechford's work that's been translated into English, and yeah. there are sort of two pieces of Lechford's work. Uh, one of the pieces, the pieces of Lechford's work um, is the wonderful dissections that he did, yeah. uh, where and he constructed those uh, that collection of uh, one meter tall models sure. of lucite, and which are now at Carnegie Mellon, yes. um, and which is absolutely fabulous. Then there's the other part of his work where he talks about 
the compression and tension forces, which he believes is how development unfolds. Right. And he has a fascinating set of hypotheses, but in his writing, he actually offers no evidence for them. Many of us, you know, my original training was as a rolfer, and many of us rolfers are, read his work and are interested in that, and everyone I've ever talked to gets to exactly the same place of, wow, that's cool. Now what? Uh, how could we use that? <laughs> and it ends right there. So who then? So who then? <laughs> and Blechman isn't around to teach us anymore. Earlier, and you were asking right. about courses in embryology for body workers. And you can't even like I've even tried to take them in, in medical schools, and they don't. They're not even teaching human embryology in most medical schools mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, don't, even, don't even get me started. Or if they do, it's all gene expression it's, it's uh, embryology. Yeah. You're going to do it, right, Joe? Yeah, I'm going to well, do it. I'll do it. Stay tuned. There's my business cards. You know, they're, 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 it's not on my website yet, but it will be. Okay. And actually, I'm... I'm You're writing. What? So, I just want to say also that um, in body, mind, centering, body, game, and tone is going into embryology from an experiential point of view. So looking at... And she really... It's just the first eight weeks. I mean, that's where her focus is right now. And so looking at the lung blood and yeah. what, what is that? So it, it's a, inviting the tissues, inviting us to remember that we experience all of these movements. So and it's a really exciting. Um, it is exciting, but it's doing the same thing as what he was saying the first guy was doing. It's like it's projecting adult psychology on the embryologic. Courses, you know, well, like, I, don't, I don't think that's entirely fair. I took this course and I thought it was fantastic. I learned a lot. I know a lot of people are very enthusiastic about yeah. Van der Waal, so uh, really, uh, a lot of people are. And I give my not very humble opinion that <laughs> I don't care for it. But <laughs> there are probably more things we can disagree about. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, yes, observation of breath is very useful. Yeah. There's, there's also um, uh, some contour things. If you see somebody whose ribs flare out at the bottom, that's a strong indication that they have uh, respiratory diaphragm to chest wall adhesions and have had for a while yeah. down there. Okay? So we going to learn how to get rid of this? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then there is mobility testing. You can find out whether it glides or not. Okay. Um, now look, uh, in the hour and a half that I've got here, I can't quite teach you all, but uh, I hope to send a hope with some useful pieces that uh, you can do some things with. So I'd like to uh, launch into a bit of mobility testing uh, part of this to show you some, how some of this works. Uh, so could I have a volunteer, please? Step right up. <laughs> what is your name? I'm Lisa. Lisa. Good. Lisa, do you have any current medical conditions that would be useful for me to know about? No. No? Oh, I have hypothyroid Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's not likely to have so much effect on direct on what we're doing, but thank you for telling me about the Hashimoto's disease. All right. So what I'd like you to do is turn to face the camera here and step forward just a little bit so I can be behind you. And what I'm going to do as you're standing here is put my hands uh, on your rib cage here. Tell you what, turn this way, another 45, so people can see where I'm putting my hands. Here. Okay, I've got pinkies on about 12th ribs right there. I'm going to broad grip on lower thorax. All right then, turn with your back to me again. So what I'm going to do is attempt a spiral movement through the thorax here, where we're going to go over here, and that's just not really very easy to do. And we're going to try going over here, and oh my, that's ever so much easier to do. <laughs> that little test is a strong indicator that there are pleural adhesions on the left side. And the lung should be able to glide inside as you do that. Okay. So, would you describe what that felt like from the inside as I was doing? Um, it moved much more freely. It felt there was a greater sense of ease. And when I moved to the right, it just felt smaller, um, felt tethered. Mm -hmm. And as you're standing there, just take a deep breath and let it right out again. Mm -hmm. 
And you see how this shoulder sits higher than the other one, this side fills more than the other one. So we have a number of indicators that there are some left-sided pleural adhesions. Left-sided pleural adhesions are more common than on the right. Why? The heart? The heart? The heart creates pleural adhesions? Hmm? Most people use their right hand. Um, probably more popular right-handed, but this is not related to handedness. Here's the deal. It's in the art. It is related to the heart, and it's in the architecture of the bronchial tree. The right bronchus is at a steeper angle, about a 45. The right lung is 50% larger than the left one because the heart's more on the left. Mm -hmm. So the right bronchus is fatter. It's at a steeper angle. The left one has to get over the heart to get to the lung, so it's much more close to level. It's smaller diameter and it's longer. It doesn't drain as well. Mm -hmm. It makes you bronchitis bait on the left side. Mm -hmm. So uh, people are much more likely to end up with left-sided pleural adhesions from infections. Is the mobility always going to be less on the left side then, or generally? On the side with the greater adhesions. Oh, okay, but so that shortness or lateral doesn't that is not what is creating the, the, the architecture of the bronchial tree is not what's creating the movement difference mm -hmm. it is possible to get adhesions on the right and not the left all kinds of odd things happen with infections and people fall off their horses and land on their right side they get in, they're in their bicycle and get hit from the right by a car all kinds of things how do, but how do you differentiate that from you know injury to any of the, of the lateral muscles and the Mm -hmm. and thoracic. Uh, you, you can make differential diagnosis with looking at uh, costal pleural, or pardon me, costal vertebral joints, which frequently get tight, and you can look at stretchiness between the individual ribs. And often it's useful to make those sorts of differential diagnosis, the assessment and mobility testing. This is just a quick screen for where might there be some. In fact, it looks like she has some on the left. But where? We don't know yet. Behind, in front, beside, toward the wall of the mediastinum, down to the diaphragm, right up in the apex? Who knows? We will find out these things. Okay. So I'm going to carry on a little bit farther here with analyzing where this is, and then I'm going to have you uh, begin some of this analysis. Okay. All right. So let's try side to side. If we go over here, whee! Going the other way, eh. Okay. <laughs> So this is starting to suggest to me that it's more likely that we have something laterally out here that won't glide. Yes. But there might be more than that. Okay. Tell you what, turn this way in there. Okay. Then, uh, actually, go another 45. I'll get you to be back here. Okay. There are moments when I wish that I had a transparent body. Normally I would be back here to do this kind of thing, but I'll be over here so you can see it, okay? Notice as I try to glide the ribs here and over here, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. And I can look at rib to spine joints. Not bad, they're moving just fine, but the ribs don't go. That strongly suggests that we have a pleural adhesion right there, okay? For troubleshooting, you're just pulling apart variables and troubleshooting. Yes, exactly. There's no one golden thing that will tell you where it is. You have to troubleshoot, as you suggest, and bring in multiple perspectives to home in on this. Okay. Would you lie on your back, please, with your head up here? Okay. Now, I'm interested in uh, the possibility that we have a rib to diaphragm adhesion down here, and here we have flare in the lower left ribs, and we don't on the right. That's consistent with, with uh, uh, costal diaphragmatic recess adhesion down here, a contour sign. Over here, if I get a hold of this costal margin and try to move things around, oh, look at this. Over here, not. Again, consistent with a costal pleural, uh, costal diaphragmatic recess adhesion right there. Okay, <clears throat> now, if I put a hand under her thorax with my fingers about there, ordinarily I'm coming in from the side like this, but again, since I like the transparent body, I'm doing it from over here. So in this instance, the tips of my fingers instead of my little finger side is about there. 
Here's the costal margin as a handle on the diaphragm. And what I want to know is they're gliding between the lower surface of the lung and the respiratory diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And what we see is there appears to be. Over here, I don't have the transparent body problem, so I get to do it as I more normally would. OK, so we have a pretty good idea that we have uh, diaphragm stuck to chest wall, lung stuck to chest wall, uh, or pardon me, lung stuck to diaphragm, lung stuck to diaphragm, lung stuck to diaphragm up here. OK. Can you please repeat the, the thing you just worked out yes. before? Yes. I'm looking at glide between the respiratory diaphragm and the inferior surface of the lung. I'm using the edge of the diaphragm here at the costal margin as a handle on the diaphragm. I bring my hand on the chest wall down past most of the lung. I realize I've got domey, dome surfaces that need to glide on each other. But, uh-uh. Just, I'm trying to do this, and it's not happening. I'm going to, in this instance, reach through to the other side. I would normally go over there, but again, because I lack a transparent body, we're doing it this way. Over here, no problem. Nice glide between the bottom of the lung and the diaphragm. So we have multiple places over here that are stiff. Okay. So what I invite you to do right away, stand again with your back to me, is get with a partner, stand them up, look at the breath. Where does it fill and where does it not fill? Look at the contour at the bottom of the rib cage. Is there flare on either side? And do this business where you get behind the person and try this spiral motion through the photo. For those three bits, as people are wrapping up the last of this, observations, what happened? What questions arose for you? When can I make an appointment? <laughs> And my cards are there. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get a lot of appointments this week. Yeah. So how do you treat this? Coming next. I love it when people are right ahead of the curriculum. It's good to find it before treating it, you know? Okay. It's nice to feel the dimensionality of the lung really get a sense of all that spaces in there. Where is it? Where is it not? Yeah. Very, very useful, yeah, to get a sense of the dimensionality of the lungs, as you suggest. 3D, all the surfaces of them. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do. All right, then. Well, uh, so what I'm teaching you here is based on the work of Jean-Pierre Barral in visceral manipulation. But the only bit uh, for treating the lungs that he ever taught in classes I was with was how to treat adhesions between the lobes of the lung, in the fissures of the lung. Huh. And in my assessments, I kept coming up with these things of lung to chest wall, lung to diaphragm, diaphragm to chest wall. So I had to figure out what to do with that. So this part of it that you're getting uh, is, is uh, my taking off from, from Baral. And in this room today, we're now doubling the number of people that I've ever taught this to. <laughs> okay, so any ideas about how you might get such an addition to let go? I do. Yes. So if the only attachment is a T4 in the midline. Yes. Maybe right here. Maybe right there. Mm -hmm. There's something to that. Uh, on some occasions, I have used the uh, cricoid cartilage to pull on the trachea to get traction on the lung huh. inside. Uh, on occasion, I've used that, and it can be good. The problem is, again, the lung tissue is elastic enough that it's challenging to get a, a sufficient shear force out here with traction from the, the bronchial tree up this way. So I, I made that experiment, I use it some, and I end up doing other things. I'll give you a hint. Natural rhythms in the body. Breath, yes. As people interested in craniosacral therapy, you've made extensive use of the craniosacral rhythm. You know, in, in uh, craniosacral therapy, some techniques are utilize the rhythm and some do not. But there are more rhythms in the body. In addition to the craniosacral, 
uh, rhythm. There are its lower harmonics, the uh, mid-tide and the long-tide. There's the cardiac pulse. There's the pulmonary rhythm. There's the 24-hour cortisol level cycle. There are more or less lunar months of hormonal uh, fluctuations in the body. So many rhythms. It's a wonderful big symphony. And imagine, for the lungs, the breath is the one that is most often useful for treating that. Here's the deal. What happens, what do the ribs do on normally on an inhale? They rotate up or down. They rotate up or down. So if these the ribs are more or less C-shaped, if my thumb ends or the spinal ends, they come up with bucket handles and lift up in the front. Down on exhale. So there's generally speaking an up movement of rib on inhale, a down movement of rib on exhale. Okay, coming back to inhale, as the ribs are swinging up, is the lung moving? And if so, how? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hmm? Down. Down. Very good. Uh, at the same time that the ribs are coming up, remember that the respiratory diaphragm is contracting and flattening down. And because of lymphatic induced vacuum outside the lungs, the lungs cannot escape the respiratory diaphragm. So the bottom end of the lung is pulled down. So does the whole lung descend then? No. What happens? It stretches. Remember, the upper end of the lung has a functional fixation here. And in fact, as you inhale, the upper end is lifted and the respiratory diaphragm is going down so that the lung elongates vertically. So most of the lung is going down and the lower you are in the lung, the more down it goes on inhale at the same time that the ribs are swinging up. Questions about mechanics? Well, I have a question about pain related. Yes. Because I've got a, one person in particular where it just is recurring in the serratus, and it's like seventh, eighth, sixth, seventh, and it's just no matter what visceral, I mean, or muscle work and that sort of thing, and connective tissue scene, does not seem to obviate mm -hmm. the condition. So, in this situation where there's recurring mm -hmm. uh, pain, stiffness near the uh, right on the rib, it's almost like it, it, yeah, like serratus, serratus but origins like a, out here, but it feels more like a bruised rib to her. Mm -hmm. That could be a pleural adhesion right there, and that could be part of the muscular guarding to protect that person. Because she's had plenty of trauma, form. physical trauma. Yeah. So, or it can also be again, because I, I couldn't quite I tell you everything in this course. But it can also be physical tension in uh, intercostal arteries and intercostal nerves. Take the Baral courses on that. They're very good. Okay. okay. Thanks. All right. But certainly, pleural adhesions is a candidate for why that keeps coming back. And the muscles are guarding that. And the muscles aren't very eager to give it up because they're busy saving your life. Mm -hmm. And they won't stay fixed. Okay. If that's what it is. All right. So. In normal breath, ribs are going up and lungs going down, but if they're stuck to each other, of course, it doesn't quite happen like that. But what we can do is use breath to separate them. Um, and I will, if I may, demonstrate. <laughs> You've been waiting, I know. Okay, so my turn 180 again. So we have identified that up here, glidey, glidey, up here, eh, not so glidey. All right, we have, and we looked at costovertebral joints, which are moving just fine, so we have pretty good confidence that we have a lung to chest wall adhesion right there. Okay, here's how we deal with that. Um, lie on the table with this side down and your head over here. So, facing? No, oh. your right side down. Oh, ow. Yeah. Yeah. Some kind of pillow. Anything like a pillow? Well, that'll do. Her arms under there. Okay, so. Bring your whole body back a little bit closer to me. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sink into the ribs here in the back. I'm going to load the ribs superiorly. I'm going to ask her to exhale fully, which is going to bring her diaphragm up, which is going to take the lung up, which will make me take her ribs even more superior. I'm going to hold the ribs superior. 
and then I'm going to ask her to inhale again, and she's going to pull her lung down, and she's going to take it apart from the inside. You're going to stay where you are? I'm going to stay where I am. I'm going to be giving a substantial superior mechanical load to the ribs. This ain't no five gram stuff. This is a very mild mechanical, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. This is kilograms. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm going to slip my arm in here. And so again, I'm going to sink into the ribs one more time. We're not trying to treat skin. That won't get it. you got to sink into the ribs. And I'm going to take these ribs superior. Notice I'm going toward the top of her head. Exhale fully. Keep your shoulders relaxed. Oh. Which leads, lets me take her ribs up more. And I'm going to keep them there. Now breathe in again. Go for it. Get all you can. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Now stand again. Stand facing the whiteboard here. And remember, over here before, this was relatively movable. And this was not. And now this goes too. Because she just pulled that adhesion apart inside while I held her, her ribs up up there. This one is relatively easy. And it also all gave all at once. Sometimes it will be a more gradual process inside, just like any other release. Sometimes you might have to do it three times to get there. This was quick and easy. Turn around again this way. Step forward one step. Oh, okay. So... Before, this was the easy way, and now this way is easier than it was before. It's still not as easy as the other side, but we took out one of the adhesions in there, so it's easier than it was. Okay. <clears throat> um, so you saw me take apart one that was high in the back right there. If it's anywhere in the back, the side, the front, like that, the process is essentially the same. Just whatever parts of the ribs that is, I take them up. I'm lining this side down again. <clears throat> so, if it had been here, if this arm be someplace up here that works for you, mm -hmm. I would have loaded the ribs this way. Okay. Had it been high in the front up there, my hand hold would be similar to what I was doing before, but instead of loading the ribs high in the back, I'd load them high in the front mm -hmm. up here. And then the same basic process, full exhale, which takes the ribs up. Remind the person not to engage their shoulders. That's counterproductive. And then you take the ribs up more, and then on the, as they inhale, they'll pull it apart from the inside. So, go find one and see what you can do about that. Are you gonna treat the diaphragm? The diaphragm ones? <laughs> have to use a different technique for that. And if you're reasonably expeditious with this, I'll have time to treat you to treat the diaphragm. Okay. So find a stopping place with what you're doing, or continue a little bit as I talk. Okay, let's talk a little bit about safety. What kind of issues come to mind where you might not want to do this? Somebody with a pneumothorax. Yeah. Somebody's already got a pneumothorax. No, no, no. This is not the treatment they need. Yeah. ER. Now. Okay. Osteoporosis. If somebody has a, a current or recent broken ribs or bruised ribs, no, no, no. Let that heal well first. Come back in a few months, like four months from now, we'll think about it. Any other ideas? Baby with a broken clavicle. Baby with a broken clavicle. Later on. Yeah. Let it heal. Uh, by the way, for babies who can't well, ask them to do the inhale, exhale, that's fine. Just use their natural breath. The adhesions aren't well established any way they're tender. Just hold the ribs up, and as they breathe, it'll come apart on the inside for you. Got to be delicate with them anyway. Okay. Uh, what about osteoporosis? Are you going to put this kind of load on osteoporotic ribs? No. No. Cost-benefit ratio, not there. Okay. <laughs> not at all. But can you, do, can you successfully do the technique with a lighter load? Um, uh, oh. I'd like to play safe, thank you very much. Okay. How close to the edge of the cliff that will put them in great suffering and end your career do you want to go? <laughs> you know, that's a question we often get to ask in our practices, okay? Um, how much osteopenia do you want to do this with? How light a load can you make it work with? Mm -hmm. So you ride that edge a little bit, but for myself, I'm going to keep my unicycle a little farther from the edge, thank you very much, with this kind of thing. But, and it seems 
like one of the things that would prevent osteopenia and osteoporosis from developing in the ribs in the first place is if you have the muscles functioning properly to be able to load the bone, which is going to mechanically create a healthier bone tissue. Sure, just like weight bearing exercise right. is one of the things that keeps you away from it. Yes. So it's, it's like the adhesions have the potential for diminishing the bone health in the rib cage. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if somebody has emphysema and their lungs are rather fragile, do you want them doing things that are going to be tearing more lungs away from adjacent things? No. Not in my treatment room. Uh, and, you know, if somebody has current respiratory illness, a huge current respiratory illness, no, 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 don't do that. Again, give them a couple of months to heal from that before you think about it. Or an active infection, if they're having an active infection, just wait. Yeah, yeah just wait. Uh -huh. uh, always think about what is this person's condition, what's any potential vulnerability of any tissue involved in this. If the person has vascular fragility that you know about, would this be good? Probably not. You know, stay away from it. What about a baby or, or an adult patient that had been intubated recently? Or well, in, intubation is going to certainly uh, you know, chew up their, their throat and upper parts up here and make them pretty raw uh, in there. And the breathing mechanics have been uh, weird for a while. Uh, I would have a preference again for let that settle down, give them, give them some months to heal. What about the presence of stents? Presence of stents? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about cardiac, I mean, aortal and, you know, whatever, this, whatever no, bypass no, no, work no, has no, been done. No, no. After no. bypass, it's just kind of off limits. Um, no, I've done, I've done this with people who've had bypass surgery. But not. But again, a year later, after okay. everything is well healed in there. Uh, but if, if somebody comes in with a big port right here and they're currently <laughs> getting chemotherapy, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to disturb things in their thorax. No, no, no. What about herniated Say again, herniated discs? Uh, thoracic herniated discs exist. They're probably the least common part of the spine for that to, to happen in. Um, I, I give that one a caution, not a, not a contraindication on this. Go carefully. You might do them some good. I'm sorry if you already said, but I didn't catch. How much would you say percent you're giving? If we're giving five grams, what are you, what are you giving when you're doing this? Any idea? Tens of pounds. Tens of pounds? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Were we doing that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, good. Okay. It's uh, 4.15. I agree to stop now. Okay. Yay!